Let me, before I start, just, just join uh, Margie in thanking you on behalf of the Board of Health and Medicine. We are so pleased that people came to this conference, and I hope that this signals an opportunity for us as a community of health and professional and education workers to work more together. It's really critical. You know, last Saturday, as I'm sure you're aware by looking at the news and re reading uh, the papers and listening on the radio, Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Missouri. Unfortunately, even though this was in the news, it is not news. And that's really why we are here. You see, we have to learn how to connect things that happen far away to people that we don't know with what happens in our own lives. And we have to remember that what happened 100 years ago determines what we do today. And so I would be remiss not to remind us that it was just a few weeks ago that 100 years ago, the war to end all wars, World War I, began in Europe. Every August, as an American, I sit in shame when I remember this year, 69 years ago, this nation, in our name, dropped a nuclear weapon on the civilian people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That is not disconnected with Michael Brown. And we've already reminded ourselves, but I want to be here and make it personal. As a child of the projects of Cleveland, Ohio, I probably would not be standing before you today as a physician were it not for the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision of the Supreme Court. And these events don't happen by chance. They happen because of decisions that human beings make. For most people in this audience, there's a clear and well-established link between health and education. It's been extensively studied and well-documented. And in general, in general, the more education you have, the more likely you are to have habits and behaviors which we believe enhance health. You will live a life with less disease, less disability, a better health, a longer lifespan. In general, we'll talk about race and racism in a little while. So we might ask ourselves, what influence does education have on health, and what influence does, does health have on education? I want to suggest to you at the very beginning, and I hope at the end of my talk you might agree with me, that the first problem we have is we don't talk about really health and education. We tend to talk about a medical care system and schools, which I would suggest to you, especially in the United States of America, have relatively little to do with health and education. <laughs> we know the basic facts, that if you have a child with asthma and they manage to live through the end of the school day, they still will miss a lot of school. They may be hospitalized. If they don't have glasses, they can't see the blackboard. You know, when I was a little girl growing up in the projects, we had school nurses in every school. Every school. They checked our height and weight to make sure we were growing properly. They checked our vision. They checked our immunizations. And if we were behind in our immunizations, they gave us the shots. The fact that this huge city has barely 200 school nurses, is a crime. It's a crime for which somebody should be arrested. We don't have enough speech pathologists or physical therapists or counselors. Or, we don't have enough teachers. It's a problem. Now, this is what we often think. Hopefully not too many people in this room. But this is how our language frames the issue. And some people say it openly. When we focus on individuals, 
when we look at the individual person, we too often think that the problem is that poor people are stupid. That's what a lot of people think. That's what those comments talk about. You know, if you listen to talk radio, that's what they say on the air. They think the problem is that poor people just don't understand that smoking could kill them. They actually don't understand that eating fat every day will make you sick. It's dangerous for us as professionals not to be able to separate what happens to us on, as individuals on the individual level from what happens to us over large numbers of people. So when you have a policy over decades that subsidizes sugar and meat and fat and makes those foods cheaper and forces fruits and vegetables to be expensive, even though I struggle daily with my obesity, I mean, every day, I took a lot of my energy not to go get those bagels this morning. We design a system where people can't eat healthy. We create the conditions that make it impossible. The reality is if you don't have a lot of money, Mickey D's works. I'm a regular doctor. If you come and see me in my office and you smoke, I'm going to spend as much time as I can trying to get you to stop smoking. That's an important thing. But I know that the largest decreases in smoking in the United States came when we stopped subsidizing with our tax money tobacco farms. Those of us who are privileged to work in healthcare have to stand up and admit that we daily commit malpractice by not speaking out. See, we know that if you don't graduate from high school, you're gonna get sick, you're gonna get sick more often, and you're gonna die younger. We know that nationally, about a third of American children do not graduate from high school. And for blacks and Latinos, it's closer to half. But do we speak out against the budget cuts? Do you see us yelling on the evening news when they close schools? Are, is there any healthcare worker in this audience today who could not have predicted 20 years ago when they cut out gym and recess and close the school cafeterias. Is there any one of you that could not have predicted that we would see the epidemic of type 2 diabetes that we now see in our young people? I want to raise up the memory of Steve Whitman, one of our leading epidemiologists. And in his memory, I want to say, Racism, racism, racism. This is not an accident. It's not a card that's played. Racism creates the fact that in 2000, 40% of CPS teachers were black, and today it's less than 30%. That's called racism. When you lay off teachers and 65% of the teachers in the schools that are closed are black, and 40% of the tenured teachers that are laid off are black, that's called racism. You know, it's a struggle. When I see my granddaughters, I try to explain to them that reading books and doing their homework and doing well in school is important. Even though I know that the biggest single factor to their ACT score is going to be their parental income. Even though I know that. As a physician, as a teacher, as a nurse, in our day-to-day -day work, we focus on individuals, human beings that are in front of us. That's appropriate, but it's not enough. And when we focus on individuals because we feel small and powerless, even when we know what the root causes of the problems are, we do a disservice to the communities we serve. It is a public health crisis that we close these schools. We should be calling as public health professionals to open those buildings, 
fill them with preschools and libraries and technology centers, health services, services for the elderly, and even classrooms. We should be investing in communities. This is how we create healthy neighborhoods. And we need to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be healthy? Does it mean only that you're able to get up in the morning, make it to your job that they let you have, if they let you have one, do the work that the boss wants you to do, and not be able in the evening to play with your kids, not be able to work in a garden, be too tired to participate in your church, die too young to collect Social Security? Is that what we mean by health? And why do we send our children to school? Well, let me tell you what my first and favorite teacher told me. My first teacher, like for most of you, was my mother. And she remained, as long as she lived, my favorite teacher. She was not unlike so many little black girls that were born in 1927. She dropped out of high school to marry my father, had all three of her children, and then went back to school to become a teacher. And so when I was a child growing up, she got her first teaching job in the Cleveland schools. And I remember her first year, she was assigned to a first grade classroom, 50 kids. And after Christmas, after the holidays, she was, came home and she was very upset because it was the second semester, right? The first semester before Christmas, the second semester after Christmas. It was the second semester. And she looked high and low in her school and she couldn't find a reading text for the second semester of the first grade. Because as the teachers told her, nobody gets that far. What are you doing asking for that book? How did you get to the second semester? There was no expectation, expectation that those kids would ever learn to read to the second semester of the first grade. And she was so angry. And I asked her why. She said, because I got an evaluation. And my principal didn't get me the books I needed. But she criticized me because my classroom wasn't quiet. Because when the first graders left their desks, first graders, and drug their, floor, their chairs up to the reading circle, they didn't pick them up. They drug them along the floor. They made noise. And they were not immediately quiet when the principal came in, not instantly obedient. And my mother looked at me and she said, Linda, remember this. When you have children, it is not healthy for Negro children to be blindly obedient. It is not healthy for Negro children to be blindly obedient. It is important that our children learn to read and think, and they must have books to do so. So that was my life lesson about education. We need to remember that at the end of the Civil War, when our ancestors, former slaves, thought about what they needed to secure their freedom, their first and most important demand was free, universal, public education. This, above all else, is what they felt they needed to secure freedom for themselves and for me and for my grandchildren. And in that time period, and up until today, there's been a debate, a fight, in our community and other communities about what that means. Do we build education to guarantee freedom? Or do we build education to create obedient Negro children who know their place? Do we demand education just for former slaves? Or do we demand free, universal, public education throughout all the South? Because believe me, those poor, white, working class kids didn't have no education at the end of the Civil War either. This is another lesson for us. When we create conditions that help those most marginalized, it raises everyone's boat. 
In our country, education is not a right. Health is not even a right. And as health professionals, too often we lie to people. This is going to sound harsh, but think about this with me. We tell people that if they get sick, it's their fault. They eat too much of the wrong food. They watch too much TV. They live in dangerous neighborhoods. They choose to work in jobs that are dangerous, because if they were smart, they would have got a good education and they would have a better job. They smoke cigarettes. Now, please don't go out and ruin my reputation and say, Dr. Murray said you could eat fried chicken, smoke cigarettes, and lay on the couch and be healthy. Do not, that is not what I'm saying. I am not saying that the choices we make as individuals don't influence our lives. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is how healthy we are is not influenced by where we live. It's determined by all those conditions that Chewie talked about, by who has power and whether the resources are distributed fairly or unfairly. Do we distribute resources necessary for life and health and well-being in this country? Think about how we decide how resources get distributed. In this nation, we distribute resources by your race and ethnicity. How else do you explain the fact that college-educated black women like me, with good insurance, good health habits, good access to medical care, have higher infant mortality rates than white high school dropouts? How does that happen? How do we explain the fact that a mother born in Mexico who comes to this country and has a baby has birth outcomes that are excellent, that are the same as the white population. But her daughters have sicker babies, and her granddaughters sicker still. Something is wrong with this country. There's something toxic in communities where people of color live. We distribute resources by your class. I don't mean your social economics. I mean your class. I know Americans don't like to talk about class. We are not all middle class. And if you had had a good third grade public school teacher like me, you would know that we can't all be middle class. It's arithmetically impossible. Everybody can't be in the middle. And so 15% of our population lives in poverty. Now, you can live above poverty and still be poor. I'm talking about the official poverty level. 10% of our children live on less than half of the federal poverty level. You've heard the numbers already. 86% of our kids in CPS qualify for reduced or free lunch. In 2011, there were over 15,000 homeless children that we knew about in CPS. We've seen growing economic inequalities in our country. And this gap is getting worse and worse. Now, it wasn't always that way. From the end of World War II until the late 1970s, we saw an increase in people's health, income. The gaps between people began to shrink. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because there were movements fighting to make it so. Today, the top 5% of households account for 64% of the nation's wealth. The bottom 80% of our population only hold 12.8% of the nation's health. It's not just that being poor will make you sick. Even children know that. The secret is that there's a gradient this is what we don't admit to, what we fail to understand. There's a gradient. And the people that are near rich have shorter lives than the rich people. And working class people have shorter lives than the near rich. And the almost poor people have shorter lives than the working class people. It's a gradient. Let me put it to you another way. If you get on the train in D.C., in the suburbs of D.C., there's a 20-year gap in life expectancy 
between those neighborhoods at the end of the line in the suburb and between the inner city DC. 20 years. But as you ride that train, for every mile you travel, life expectancy goes down one and a half years. For every mile. So I don't care if you have a good job. Your health and your life expectancy is not as good as someone that has a better job, that's in a better situation. And obviously, unfortunately, in this country, we still distribute resources by gender. And it's amazing to me that women still make 77 cents of the poor ass wages that they pay our men. This is a question of power, political power, other kinds of power, that creates the conditions which allow people to be healthy or creates the conditions which makes them sick. It's not an accident. And we know what we need to be healthy. We need safe jobs where we're treated with respect. We need to be paid a livable wage with a guarantee of full employment. We need decent housing and healthy communities. We need the right to a quality education. We need a sustainable food system that respects the workers that grow the food, the workers that pick the food, the workers that prepare the food, and the workers that serve us the food. We need a modern, life-saving medical care system, a system where everyone, even if you work part-time, even if you're an immigrant without documents, people that we hire in our homes and businesses, people who pay taxes, people who enrich our nation, everyone deserves access to medical care. So how did we get in this mess? What happened? How did we get in this mess? Too often we ignore history and we fail to ask the right questions. We allow the media to define the issues. Let me just give you one example, one example. Now, I'm a black mother of a black man. Some of you may not appreciate what that means, but my sisters do. I am a black mother of a black man. And when I turn on the evening news, and I see rooms of children lying on blankets. And I see six-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 14-year-olds turning themselves in to the border guards. I don't think aliens, because I'm a mother of a black man. I don't think, why are they sneaking across the border? because I'm the mother of a black man. And I remember what my mother and her mother said. Can you imagine what it was like in 1920 as a mother of a black man or a black boy? As their voice deepens in Mississippi and somebody looks at them funny and you decide you gotta put them on the Greyhound bus. You gotta sneak up on the train. You got to send them to Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Chicago to Aunt Susie or Uncle Joe or just a neighbor from down the road that you heard was up there. Six million blacks escaped the terror and lack of opportunity in the southern states between world, the beginning of the century. Six million. When I see those children on TV, I see my children. But as long as they can convince us that because they're from Honduras or Colombia or El Salvador, they're not related to us, that's how we get tricked. There's a universal declaration of human rights and one of the key things about it is that all these rights are linked. And of course, health and education are part of those rights. They're indivisible. So how is it that in the richest country of the world, we can't manage to feed and house and educate our children. We can't manage to care for our elderly and sick. How did that happen? 
I am only a physician. I'm not a, I'm not a politician or a political scientist, but my political scientist friends tell me it's because of the ascendancy of a neoliberal ideology. Now, they, they had to explain to me, because you know, I, they had to explain, they said, no, no, Linda, we're not talking about liberal. This is neoliberal. This is not any relationship to what you think liberal means. This is an ideology that denies collective action. I might even consider it a psychiatric disorder. It takes this myth of the rugged individual to the stage of a religion. Now you know, or maybe you don't, ain't no rugged frontiersman as an individual lived. You know, you can't survive in the wilderness as a rugged individual. In this ideology, everything is reduced to the individual. And as individuals, we make decisions based on what works in the market. We make a decision. If you can't sell it in the market, it's not worth anything. Playing the piano is not going to get you a job, don't teach it. Art and dance and music have no place in the education of our children because our children are being educated to toil in 21st century cotton fields where we flip burgers, mop floors for wages that doom our people to poverty. It hasn't changed. Neoliberalism lulls people into believing they're all middle class. They all believe they're going to win the lottery. It's an argument that says government is useless, that government is part of the problem. Well, God damn it, we're government. For better or worse, government is us. If government is useless, if collective action is futile, then it follows logically that unions are useless. The best weapon we have. Your health is your responsibility alone. If you're sick, you must have done something wrong. You should only learn the skills you can use in the marketplace. Government, public schools, public health must be destroyed. Even though we know, as educators and health professionals, what must be done. Even though we're aware that in the past decade or so, actually the past three decades, we've been moving backwards. The gains we thought we had made in pensions and wages and housing reforms have been taken away. We still remain quiet and afraid to speak up. We know what has to happen. We need leadership from you. If we expect our children to be educated, we must have social justice. Social justice argues that collectively, through our collective planned action, we can change things that are wrong. We can make things right, we can improve people's health. Social justice says that we can clean up sewer systems, that Toledo should be able to turn on the tap and drink clean water. And just because you didn't pay your bill in Detroit, water is a basic human right, it shouldn't be cut off. Social justice argues that poverty will not always be with us. We can eliminate slums and have safe housing. We can fight for the health and safety of workers. This is not an individual issue, like the neoliberals would like us to believe. It is a collective issue. It is an issue of power, what our collective strength can do, what our power coming together can do at a ballot box, in our churches, mosques, and synagogues, in our block clubs and sororities and fraternities, social justice does not fall from the sky. It has to be fought for and won. We need a strong, large labor movement. And when I travel around the country, people are so excited to hear about CTU, which has really led the way. We need unions and organizations that will directly confront the problem of classism and racism and sexism that 
will argue for how we should determine priorities and how we distribute our common resources. The health and future of our children and grandchildren depend on the power we fight to win. And it will not be easy. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There is an almost universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. Health is fundamentally a state of social well-being. It's not what your blood pressure is or what your cholesterol level is, what your weight is, but if you're having problems, you can come see me. <laughs> health is well-being created by social conditions. Health is do you feel good? Are you happy? Do you have a good life? Will you live a long time? Health is about what we do as a society. Who is healthy and who is not tells us whether we live in a nation based on social justice or based on profit. And education is not simply one in a long list of human rights. Remember what those slaves understood. Education is the tool that we need to build a nation based on social justice. As a black woman, I am not interested in what some white man thinks my son should learn, or what the powerful, where the powerful think my granddaughters ought to work. Yes, education should teach skills. But the purpose of education is to teach people how to think. And Malcolm X said, thinking is dangerous. Our children deserve an education that teaches them to think. If people can think, then they can figure out who's keeping them down. If they can think, then they can figure out who and why people are getting sick. A healthy nation and healthy people require social justice and equity. And education is a tool we need in a democracy to change the world. That's why this fight is so critical. When we educate ourselves and our children, then together we can change this nation. We can build a planet that is healed, have a world at peace, where justice rules, and where people, all of them, can be healthy. Thank you. <laughs>